Hello, everybody. Welcome to my lecture series for my course, Sustainability Issues in Energy. Today, we are going to finish up our unit on carbon capture, utilization, and storage with a lecture on capillary seals and CO2 trapping processes in the subsurface. We'll also wrap up at the end with some discussions about the economics and feasibility moving forward of large scale carbon capture. Again, if you've been enjoying these lectures, I invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel so you get updates whenever I post videos. And please um, like if you've enjoyed this content. Okay, so what is a capillary seal? We talked in the last lecture about what capillary pressure is. And so now we're gonna talk about how we can use that to our advantage to seal the carbon dioxide below a suitable sealing layer. Okay, so this is a very simple one-dimensional diagram where we have a reservoir where you're gonna sequester your carbon dioxide. So let's imagine that's um, sandstone. And then above that, you've got some kind of a ceiling layer, which is gonna be a shale. So this is going to be a rock that has very small grains. It has a lot of clay. And most importantly, it has considerably smaller pores than what we have in the reservoir, okay? So the question is, how much carbon dioxide can we actually store here and trap it by capillary mechanisms? Okay, so we have to understand what the uh, pressure profile is uh, within the subsurface. So let's assume that the water phase is normally pressured, which means that the water pressure just follows a hydrostatic gradient. Um, for a typical subsurface brine, that's going to be about 0.447 PSI per foot, uh, neglecting water compressibility and expand, expandability. Um, we can just draw a straight line like that, which shows us the water pressure with depth. Okay, now the limiting factor here is going to be that the maximum pressure of the carbon dioxide below the seal is going to be dictated by the capillary entry pressure of the seal. Okay, so this reservoir, it's a sandstone, it's water wet, carbon dioxide is the non-wetting phase. Because it's the non-wetting phase, it's always going to be present at a pressure higher than the wetting phase, which is water. And if we don't want the CO2 to leak into the seal above the reservoir, we need to make sure that the um, capillary pressure stays below the entry pressure so it doesn't start moving into the seal. Okay. And again, that um, the entry pressure there has to be larger than or equal to the difference between the CO2 and the water phase pressure. Okay, now below that point, what's gonna happen is that the pressure of the CO2 phase will also increase, but it's not gonna increase as quickly as the water phase pressure does because uh, CO2 is less dense than water, okay? And so we can represent the pressure of the CO2 at depth just by integrating this, uh, this expression here. So we'll integrate the density as a function of depth and multiply it by gravity. And what this means is that the change in the CO2 pressure with depth is gonna be equal to the gravitational acceleration times the CO2 density, all right? Now, if we assume that the CO2 density is relatively constant over short depth increments, then we can also draw a straight line here. And what this um, shows is that eventually the CO2 pressure would intersect the water phase pressure, all right? There is one other complicating factor here, and that is the fact that our reservoir also has a non-zero capillary entry pressure, okay? All rocks do have a non-zero capillary entry pressure. Sometimes it might be very small, but non-zero. And the point here is that the carbon dioxide can only exist in the pore space within the reservoir if its pressure is larger than the entry pressure, okay? And so the farthest, the greatest depth at which the CO2 can exist is gonna be where the capillary pressure uh, is equal to the entry pressure of the reservoir, okay? Below that, the CO2 uh, will not be present, or at least it won't be present as a continuous phase, all right? So we call this point here the gas water contact. Below that, CO2 is negligible. Above that, you've got a connected column of CO2. Now, we can continue this line. This is just a hypothetical line below the gas water contact. 
And the point where this um, pressure trend would intersect the water phase pressure, that's called the free water level, okay? And like I said, that's kind of a theoretical construct. Um, there's nothing really special about the free water level, except that it is the reference depth at which the CO2 pressure and the water pressure would be equal. But remember, we're assuming there's essentially no carbon dioxide um, between the gas water contact and the free water level, okay? So we've got our seal. We know what the pressure condition is up here. That's gonna be dictated by the entry pressure of the seal. We know what this pressure is here. That's gonna be equal to the entry pressure of the reservoir. And so then if you wanna figure out what the thickness or the height of the CO2 column is between the seal and the gas water contact, you just need to know how quickly um, the CO2 pressure increases with depth, okay? And so, yeah, so like I just said, entry pressure of the seal, entry pressure of the reservoir, and the local pressure and temperature conditions, which are going to affect the um, CO2 density, right? So let's do an example problem to illustrate how this might work. So we've got a potential injection target, which is a sandstone reservoir, in which the largest pore has a radius of 10 microns, and it's lying beneath a seal with a largest pore equal to 50 nanometers in radius, okay? So there's a large difference in scale between those. Uh, the top of the reservoir is 8,000 feet below the surface, and the average temperature in the reservoir is 150 degrees Fahrenheit. We'll assume that the brine in the reservoir is normally pressured. So the question is, what is the expected depth of the gas water contact? Um, we'll make a couple of uh, simplifying assumptions here. First, that the pores in the rocks are cylinders. So uh, that makes calculating the capillary pressure easy. Um, and that CO2 behaves as an ideal gas, which you know isn't exactly true, but it makes the uh, problem here a lot easier. Um, and that the, um, the difference in density of the CO2 between the seal and where the gas water contact is gonna be is negligible. So we'll assume CO2 is an ideal gas and that the density doesn't vary significantly over the reservoir. Um, both the reservoir and the seal are completely water wet, so our contact angle is zero. Um, and the interfacial tension between the CO2 and the brine is 0.03 Newtons per meter, okay? So that's our example problem. So the first thing we need to do is to determine the entry pressures for the seal and for the reservoir, okay? So for the reservoir, we know that um, it's a cylindrical pore, so we can use Washburn's equation here to get the entry pressure. Um, capital R is the uh, largest pore radius. We know that's 10 microns, which is equal to 10 to the minus five meters. So if we work through the math here, sigma, that's the interfacial tension is 0.03. Uh, theta is zero, so cosine theta is one. And this gives us an entry pressure of 6,000 pascals, which is equal to 0.87 PSI. So like I was saying, uh, that's a very small but non-zero entry pressure. Now for the seal, we'll go through the same exercise. The only thing that's gonna be different is that capital R here is 50 nanometers, which is five times 10 to the minus eight meters. So when we work through the math, we get an entry pressure of 1.2 megapascals, which is equal to 174 PSI, okay? So those are our pressure boundaries at the seal and at the gas water contact. So now the question is, what is the difference in depth between those two points? So here's uh, an illustration just to show you what we're dealing with. So that pressure difference right at the seal is 1.2 megapascals. This pressure difference at the gas water contact, that was uh, six kilopascals. So what depth interval do we need to get the um, uh, capillary pressure to decrease um, by that amount, okay? Now to, to figure that out, we need to know what the density of the carbon dioxide is. And, um, we are going to use the ideal gas law for that. So the ideal gas law is um, probably the simplest equation of state uh, that you can have for a gas. And an equation of state just relates pressure, um, molar volume, and temperature together. Um, so this is the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. 
you know, pressure, volume, N is uh, the number of moles present, and then R is gonna be your universal gas constant. Um, so we can solve for pressure by dividing both sides by volume. So this gives you pressure as a function of number of moles and uh, temperature, okay? Now, the um, number of moles can be related to the mass of the gas that's present. We're gonna call that little m. So number of moles is mass of gas present divided by the molar mass, okay? So that's gonna be uh, mass per number of moles. So if we make those substitutions, we take n and substitute it for um, little m over big M. And so that gives us this expression here. Now, what we have here then is a mass of gas present divided by the volume of gas present. Well, that's just density, right? So then we can say that the pressure is equal to CO2 density divided by molar mass times the universal gas constant times temperature. And then we can solve this for density. And we come up with this expression here that the CO2 density is equal to pressure times molar mass divided by universal gas constant times temperature, okay? So that's how we figure out with the ideal gas law what the density of our gas is gonna be. Now, again, CO2 does not behave exactly ideally. Um, you'd probably be better off uh, using something like a Peng-Robinson equation of state if you're into that sort of thing. But for this simple problem, um, the ideal gas law will get us a number um, that we can use without having to solve a cubic, uh, find the cube root of, a, of an equation. Okay, so here's our equation again. Um, and then we can plug in some numbers here. Uh, we know that the temperature is 150 degrees Fahrenheit, so we need to convert that to Kelvin. That's 338 Kelvin. Uh, the molar mass of CO2 is 0.044 kilograms per mole. And uh, the universal gas constant is always 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin. So when we put those values in here, if pressure is unknown, uh, M over R times T, that's gonna be a constant using those values that are right here. So we see that CO2 pressure, uh, excuse me, CO2 density is equal to pressure times 1.57 times 10 to the minus five. Again, this assumes that your pressure is in Pascals and you're gonna get a density in kilograms per cubic meter, okay? Now, just below the seal, so in this equation, the P, the pressure value that we're gonna use is gonna be the water phase pressure, okay? So just below the seal, what's the water phase pressure? Well, we know that the depth is 8,000 feet, so the uh, so we'll multiply 8,000 feet by the uh, normal hydrostatic gradient, which is 0.447 psi per foot, and then to that product we'll add atmospheric pressure, 14.7 psi. So this will get us a value in absolute pressure. So it's 3590 psi absolute, uh, which is 24.8 megapascals. Okay. So the CO2 pressure then is going to be um, the sum of the water phase pressure and the capillary pressure. So we know the capillary pressure here is 1.2 megapascals, um, and that gives us a CO2 pressure of 26 megapascals. So then if we use that to plug into our CO2 density equation, uh, we multiply 2.6 megapascals times that constant we figured out on the previous slide, and that gives us a density of 408 kilograms per cubic meter. So that is less than half the density of water, and so this um, line here is going to be considerably steeper than the water line. Okay, so below the seal, the water phase pressure uh, increases 0.447 psi per foot or 10.1 kilopascals per meter. The CO2 pressure increases at a rate of gravitational acceleration times density, as we saw before. And so that gives us a CO2 gradient of four kilopascals per meter. And so we know that at the gas water contact, the CO2 pressure will be six kilopascals larger than the water pressure, okay? So this becomes um, a uh, fairly simple uh, system of equations to solve. And so we can write an expression for um, the pressure at some arbitrary distance which we'll call D below the seal, okay? And um, 
we can uh, solve for the difference between the water phase and the CO2 phase pressure, okay? So this is the CO2 phase pressure here, okay? So it's gonna be 26, uh, 2.6, excuse me, 26 megapascals plus four, um, I'm, I'm ri actually writing this in, uh, in kilopascals, okay? So it's 26,000 kilopascals plus four kilopascals per meter times the depth below the seal. And then uh, to get the capillary pressure, we need to subtract the water phase pressure, which is 24,800 kilopascals plus 10.1 kPa per meter times depth, okay? Now, at the gas water contact, that is gonna equal six, okay? So first, what we're gonna do is um, we can simplify uh, this equation here. So if I subtract 24,800 from 26,000, I get 1,200. And then if I subtract 10.1 times D from four times D, I get a negative 6.1 D. Okay, so that right-hand side is simply this expression here, simplified. And we know that this is the uh, capillary pressure at any depth below the seal. So we can find the point where the depth at which this right-hand side equals six. So we'll write this expression here, six equals 1200 minus 6.1 times D. And then we solve for D and we see that D is 196 meters, which is equal to 642 feet. So for this particular configuration of reservoir and seal, we can um, hold up to a 642 foot CO2 column. So that's pretty good. Okay, um, this was obviously a very simple example. Um, things we did not talk about are the fact that if the entry pressure of your seal is really big, what can happen is that the CO2 can actually create um, fractures, gas-driven fractures in the seal at pressures lower than the entry pressure. Um, this can be a big problem because once you open a fracture, that is essentially a superhighway for CO2 leakage. Um, so you really want to avoid that. It's important to know not just the capillary entry pressure of your seal, but also the mechanical properties of it. Um, for instance, the, uh, the tensile strength and uh, things like that. Um, the other thing is that, you know, it's one thing just to hold back the CO2 by a capillary seal, but as it turns out, there's actually a whole bunch of places where CO2 can leak um, and get back to the surface. For example, abandoned oil and gas wells. If the CO2 finds its way to one of those, it can leak up to the atmosphere through it. Um, it can also leak around your injection well. So if you did a bad job with your cement and your casing in the well, um, the CO2 can just leak right back out there. Uh, here's a really good uh, illustration of all the different ways that carbon dioxide can leak out of the subsurface, okay? So let's imagine you've got a power plant here and you're injecting CO2 into the subsurface. Okay, so your intended target here is uh, a reservoir here with a seal around it. Okay, some things that can happen are, it can leak back up through a poor cement job around your injection well. It can find its way to an oil well and leak back up through there. Um, it can accumulate in shallower layers that you weren't intending, even very close to the, um, very close to the surface. Uh, can diffuse into bodies of water. Um, you can have leakage over here through unintended places where maybe you've got a fault or a fracture where it can find its way back up to the surface. Um, it can diffuse and, and dissolve and move around through the groundwater. Uh, it can find an abandoned well. Um, it can even find a water well and leak to the surface. Um, you know, it can accumulate in people's basements. So there's a lot of different risk factors here that you have to be cognizant of when you're looking at CO2 injection. Site characterization is essential for reducing the risk associated with these leakage processes. So capillary trapping or, or you know, trapping beneath the capillary seal is only one trapping mechanism that is expected to operate in a CO2 sequestration reservoir. Um, and these, uh, the uh, trapping mechanisms actually change over time. So this is a classic figure from Benson and Cole. Um, initially, when you inject your CO2, it's gonna be trapped by capillary forces beneath some kind of a seal, okay? But as you move forward in time, different trapping me mechanisms will start to take over. So the y-axis here 
is um, the percentage of the total trapping that is contributed by the different mechanisms. So you can see, and then the x-axis is uh, logarithmic, but it's the number of years since you stopped your injection. So initially, you know, 80% of your trapping is going to be, you know, beneath the capillary seal, structural stratigraphic trapping. Um, there'll be some, you know, residual trapping with those, you know, ganglia left behind after the CO2 plume moves through, like we talked about last time. And then, um, you know, solubility also. CO2 has a relatively high solubility in, in brine. But as you move forward, um, what's going to happen is a lot of this um, CO2 that's trapped beneath the seal will start dissolving and precipitating as a mineral. And so you'll actually, over time, reduce the amount of trapping that's due just to capillary mechanisms. And you will increase your residual trapping and your solubility trapping. And eventually, eventually you'll mineralize it through a lot of the um, orthogenic um, mineral reactions we talked about um, we talked about previously. And so, you know, I've seen some figures where the uh, x-axis here is actually um, adjusted because I think there's, you know, some of the research coming out of the um, CarbFix site in Iceland actually has shown that a lot of these processes happen faster than um, we anticipate. So you can move very quickly to solubility trapping and mineral tra trapping um, much faster than might be suggested by this figure. So that's, um, that's very encouraging. Okay, another topic I want to touch on here is uh, CO2 enhanced oil recovery, uh, or CO2 EOR is what we call that. So one thing you can do is, um, rather than just injecting the CO2 into the subsurface, you can actually use it to push oil out of a reservoir where a lot of the oil has been produced and you're having trouble getting the rest of it out. Okay, so um, in doing this process, uh, some of the CO2 will be left behind as a residual phase, okay? So in this process, you end up sequestering some carbon dioxide in the reservoir while also producing some oil, okay? Um, so it's, you know, there's a very fine balancing act here. So, you know, if you look at figures from the IEA, um, in the United States, uh, CO2 EOR uses somewhere between 300 and 600 kilograms of CO2 per barrel of oil produced. Okay. Now, once you produce that oil, you know, you have to, um, you know, refine it and transport it, and then eventually it gets combusted. And so that entire oil supply chain releases about 500 kilograms of CO2. So if you can optimize this number here, where you are uh, using less than 500, 500 kilograms of CO2 to produce your oil, you can have carbon neutral or even carbon negative oil, okay? And like I said, this is a fine balancing act, but it's possible. So a lot of this has to do with how you design your gas injection process. So there's really three ways you can inject the gas. You can do what's called continuous gas injection, where you just, you have an injector well, and you're just continuously injecting CO2 to push the oil out, okay? Um, another way you can do that is uh, you can do what's called a WAG, a water alternating gas flood, where you inject some CO2, then chase it with water, inject some more CO2, chase it with water, et cetera, et cetera. And each one of these cycles can last somewhere between months and, and years. It's a very long-term thing. Um, what the water does here is that it um, helps push the oil out after it has mixed with the CO2, okay? So um, like I said, each pulse lasts for months to years. Um, then there's another, a, um, another strategy called water curtain injection. This can be either combined with continuous gas injection or WAG. Now, what you do in this case is you'll have your um, injection and production wells up here. And then surrounding that, you'll have a bunch of water injection wells. And this is particularly good for reservoirs where you've got some amount of um, subsurface topography so that the water here will you know, move up dip and help push the CO2 and the oil uh, to, towards the producer well, okay? So how much can we actually sequester using CO2 EOR? So there's been a lot of work done on this over the years within, within the US. Um, I'm gonna highlight one particular study from a site in Southwestern Mississippi called the Cranfield site. Um, 
So there's um, a large amount of um, CO2 that can be delivered to Cranfield. So they have a nice source of CO2. And um, there's been, you know, a lot of, like I said, a lot of work done on this. So here's some, um, these are some reservoir simulation results looking at how much oil you can produce and how much cumulative CO2 you can store as a function of the amount of CO2 you've injected, okay? And this is for different injection strategies, continuous gas injection, WAG, water curtain uh, with continuous injection, and then water curtain with WAG, okay? So what you notice is that um, the continuous gas injection actually gives you the best uh, cumulative oil production. It also gives you the highest amount of cumulative CO2 stored. Um, what you do notice for all these curves here for CO2 storage is that they reach a maximum and then tail off at the end. And that's related to CO2 breakthrough. So you actually start getting CO2 being produced at the, um, at the production well. So that's CO2 that's not, not being sequestered. So this looks pretty good. I mean, you know, this is, you know, millions of tons of CO2. So, you know, 2 million tons, if my math is correct, that's 2 billion kilograms of CO2 that you could, uh, you could store here. Now, unfortunately, it's not really that simple. And the, the reason for that is because there's energy uh, taken up in this process. So you've got to purify the incoming gas stream uh, to just get the CO2. Um, you also need to account for the CO2 that's produced by um, combusting the oil that you've produced. Um, so on all these curves here, these are for our different uh, gas injection schemes, continuous gas injection, water curtain, WAG, and WAG plus water curtain. And the point here is that for all these curves here, um, these just represent different technologies that can be used for um, purifying the, uh, the CO2 stream. Whenever these curves are below the red line, so below zero, that means you've got a net sequestration of CO2. What you notice here is that for all the different injection strategies, if you inject for too long, you actually negate um, the you know, carbon negative nature of this process because you start using too much energy for gas separation and you start producing too much oil so that its carbon emissions are you know, not being offset by what's being sequestered. So you gotta plan these projects um, very carefully. Now, how much does it cost? Um, so this is a nice figure um, for a whole bunch of different um, types of uh, carbon sequestration. Um, and it's plotted as a function of uh, dollars per ton of CO2. So if we look at you know, these different technologies, we can think about how much it would cost to sequester the total atmospheric car CO2 concentration, and then just the energy-related CO2 emissions from the year 2021. So total atmospheric CO2 is about 3.3 times 10 to the 15 kilograms. So if we're injecting these into sedimentary reservoirs, um, we, it would cost about $33 trillion. Okay, that's a lot. Um, if we're looking at direct air capture and putting that into uh, peridotite, like um, you know, what's being done at um, you know, some, some places around the world, uh, you're looking at 132 trillion to 16 quadrillion dollars. Okay, that's a lot. Now we're obviously not going to remove all of the CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, but what if we just think about offsetting uh, energy-related CO2 emissions? So in 2021, we estimate those to be about 3.6 times 10 to the 10 kilograms. So that's 36 billion kilograms. Um, to put those in sedimentary reservoirs, that would cost about 36 million dollars a year. Now, that's actually not that bad. Um, even for the really high end here, air capture and peridotite with pumping, um, you're looking at somewhere between 144 million to $18 billion per year. That's a little on the pricey side, but you know, it's not unreasonable to think that you know, with technological advances in air capture, maybe you could bring that number down. So this actually isn't so bad in terms of you know, cost outlay. Now, the real question is, if you are a company that um, captures and sequesters CO2, how do you make money? Okay, so um, we estimate that it costs somewhere between 130 and 460 dollars uh, 
to quote unquote abate a metric ton of CO2 just in the United States. Um, and what we mean by abate is that that's either sequester it or keep it from being emitted in the first place. Um, and this comes from a really interesting study by Greenstone and Nath where they looked at um, states that have mandates for um, a certain fraction of electricity generation to be renewable. And they looked at the incremental you know, cost of electricity in those states related to these mandates. So that's the number they came up with, okay? So you know, it actually costs money to do this. Now, um, there's this uh, 45Q tax credit, um, which is you know, 26 US code section 45Q. This provides a tax credit for CO2 sequestration. Um, it's up to $35 per metric ton for enhanced oil recovery, and it's up to $50 per metric ton uh, just for storage. Okay, now you look at these numbers, 35 bucks, 50 bucks, and then compare it to these numbers. You know, you're not gonna make money just be rely by relying on the tax credit because it costs more to abate your CO2 than you're getting for the tax credit. And, you know, we gotta come up with some better ways of incentivizing and uh, making this actually a profitable enterprise. So another possibility is this cap and trade strategy. Um, so this, in a cap and trade, you put a limit on the amount of CO2 that you can emit by any CO2 source, a power plant or anything else. And so then you give emitters a certain number of emission allowances. And so if you're an emitter and you make your process more efficient and you're emitting less, you'll have leftover allowances that you can sell then to other emitters who maybe aren't as efficient. So that's the trade component. Um, and so there are some markets around the world that have been set up for this cap and trade strategy. Um, we've got some in the US, California, um, there's an East Coast uh, market, it's called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Uh, Quebec has uh, one, and then there's also a cap and trade market in Europe. Um, but the deal with this is that, you know, trading the allowances, they're only going for like between six and $25 per metric ton. Again, that's like a hundred times too small <laughs> to, be able to make money based on the abatement costs. So this right now is also not a really great way to make money. And you know, as it stands now, carbon sequestration is only economically feasible when you're combining it with another process that actually does make money, okay? Whether that be electricity generation, oil extraction, that sort of thing. You know, you're not going to make money just by capturing CO2 right now. So what this means is that, you know, barring any massive changes in the CO2 sequestration market, really what's gonna, what we need is growth in the utilization sector so that you can combine your carbon sequestration with other ways of actually making money. And so I think that's where a lot of the focus needs to be in the future. You also need to make the um, process of sequestering the CO2 more efficient so you can bring that, you know, couple of hundred dollars per metric ton number way, way down. And maybe if you can do that and it can make sense actually to start getting these 45Q credits, then, you know, maybe it's not such a big deal, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. So that wraps up our unit on uh, carbon capture utilization and storage. I really hope you've enjoyed it and found it informative. And next time we are gonna start our unit on geothermal energy. So you geothermal stands out there, I know you're out there. Stay tuned. We'll have that coming up soon. So thanks for watching, and hopefully I'll see you in the next one.